was the malevolent deity Null who forged the All Black. All Black took the shape of a sword, and yet it was, in fact, the first symbiote, a being capable of bonding with its host and augmenting him. Null soon made an army, but when Thor destroyed his connection to them, the symbiotes turned on their creator and they imprisoned him. For the first time ever, the symbiotes were free. They developed a sense of honor and nobility, and they began to bond with others. But while their physical forms were strong, the symbiotes themselves remained dependent on their hosts. Not all hosts are good. Not all symbiotes are well-meaning. And even the most benevolent of them can be used as weapons. Before I begin today, I want to show you something cool. I just got back from Japan, and while I was there, I recovered an artifact from my childhood. This is the Giver. I love the Giver. The first movie was released in 1989, and when little Jonah saw this, his brain almost boiled over. I mean, sure, it might look painfully dated now, but for a young aspiring monster maker, this movie had it all. The reason I'm showing you this today is because the Giver is a symbiotic, bioorganic suit of armor that bonds with its host and augments their abilities. Sound familiar? Marvel symbiotes first appeared in 1984, just one year before the Giver comic book. And just like the Giver, they are awesome. Except, how do symbiotes work? What's the science behind them? How does their host fit inside them? How do they see? How do they feel? How are their senses augmented by their living suit? I am your host, and we're connecting right now. To ensure that we stay connected, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. The first of the five questions I always ask myself as I begin a new character is, what is their personality? Well, while it's very difficult to guess at the psychology of an alien race composed of shape-shifting protoplasm and teeth, there are anthropomorphic hallmarks shared by almost all symbiotes that can clue us into their primary psychological features. Symbiotes, judging from their eyes and their mouths, are savage and joyous. They're like dolphins. We love them because they always look like they're smiling even when they aren't. Going further, our subject today is Venom, ex-symbiote to Spider-Man, best friend to Eddie Brock, eater of brains and chocolate. Venom is without a doubt savage and joyous. It's impossible not to love him. That huge joker smile, the long lashing tongue, the 7,000 teeth, he just screams joie de vivre. Now the next question to tackle is, what is their body type? Well, by themselves, symbiotes are shapeless and oozing. But when symbiotes bond to humans, they generally assume the build of their wearer. There are variations, of course, and even the psychology of their hosts can affect the shape of their paired symbiote. But since we have to settle on a word for body type, let's focus in on one last physical aspect of symbiotes, one that we haven't mentioned yet. Symbiotes are filled with muscle. It might not look like human muscle, it's thinner and stringier, more amorphous in nature. But inside all that slime, symbiote bodies are absolutely shredded with countless tentacles of tough, writhing, snake-like muscle. This is how they get around, after all. And because today we're using Eddie Brock as our host and Venom as our symbiote, making Venom our primary reference for the day, the word we'll use to guide us in our drawing will be brawny. Yes, we are only drawing this head and a bit of a neck, and still the word brawn will guide the shapes that we use. They'll be bigger, thicker, bulkier than if we were drawing, say, Carnage, whose body type could best be described as gaunt and skeletal. In that case, we'd use straighter, more angular lines to create a sleeker, sharper silhouette. Okay, so after a little finagling, that's that, our thumbnail is finished. It's far from perfect, but it gives us all that we need to keep going to the next step. So my thinking, as we begin to ink here, is that Eddie Brock needs to be totally submerged into the symbiote. Otherwise, you'd see his face every time Venom opened his mouth, which is always. And yet, basic spatial reasoning dictates that his head must be just inside the mouth. So I've placed Eddie just inside the soft palate of Venom's mouth, right under the gums, so that even when he opens his mouth wide, you still don't see his face. And I have it so that the base of Venom's tongue runs back into his own mouth. And this has got me thinking. What if Venom's tongue, which is always hanging out and thrashing around, doesn't just smell the air like a cobra? What if it feeds him oxygen, like the tube on a scuba mask? 
Might that help to explain why the flesh of his mouth is raw and pink, unlike the entire rest of his skin? Because it's actually serving a different physiological purpose? I'm just spitballing here, so to speak. But we are illustrating Marvel anatomy, and Marvel has entrusted us with the job of figuring this stuff out. Provided they approve of our ideas, what we're creating today could be inducted into the realm of canon. So let's keep brainstorming and trying to come up with good ideas. Even as we venture farther and farther afield, let's touch base and revisit the next in our five questions. What are Venom's iconic elements? Well, while most heroes have to depend on a haircut or a special weapon to set them apart and make them memorable, the symbiote design is iconic in and of itself. I've identified three iconic elements that define the aesthetic of a symbiote. Their skin, their eyes, and of course, their mouths. The first, skin. Symbiotes have shining, wet-looking skin. Now, I imagine that this wetness is an illusion, like how snakes always appear to look slimy but are in fact totally dry. Because if a symbiote's skin was actually wet all the time, well then they need a water fountain every five minutes. Still, this slick shine is a hallmark of their appearance, and we will tackle this aspect in the coloring stage. The eyes. Symbiote eyes are not round balls like so many others in the animal kingdom. They're flat surfaces like sunglasses. They are long and wide and narrow, but they're generally defined by jagged curling edges. In today's illustration, we will attempt to explain why their eyes are so long and how this benefits their host. And the third thing, the mouths. Not all symbiotes have mouths, but the best ones do. And they are all impossibly large and smiling, with long flailing tongues, which you have to imagine they bite all the time, and a chaotic assortment of teeth. Now, as a professional creature designer, I'm usually constrained by practicality. Just look at the death claw from Fallout 4. Its jaws and teeth fit together perfectly. They're designed maximized for life in the wasteland. The death claw uses its claws to kill. Its teeth, therefore, are short and blunted and not very numerous. They're better suited for crushing skulls than rending flesh. But when it closes its mouth, that mouth is closed. Symbiote teeth are something else altogether. Given their shape-shifting nature, their teeth are never set in place. Symbiotes have no dedicated incisors or molars. Their teeth are all sharp, hooked canines. In fact, you can't even say that symbiotes have jaws because they have no jaw bones. Their mouths simply widen. They're like the violator from Spawn. Really, really fun to draw, but biologically impractical. Like bulldogs. All right, so we're pretty much finished with the inks. This was a lot of fun. Let's make the transition over to color. But before we do, let me just remind you that if you're enjoying this channel, please don't forget to leave a comment. I read all the comments, even when it takes me all day, and I do my best to respond to all of them. I also wanna remind you that I am on Instagram and Twitch. As we begin the coloring process, let me just make note of three particular detail images that I'll be working on. I won't show process videos of them all, but I want you to know what they are in case they're confusing. They are detail images of the eyes, the teeth, and the tongue. More on those in a bit, but first let's go tackle the next in our five questions. What is Venom's color and pattern scheme? Well, this one is easy. Venom's head is all black, with white eyes and a fleshy pink mouth. The black we use will have a slick blue sheen. The white will be sort of an off-white with a gasoline rainbow shine. And the fleshy pink mouth will be just glorious. The teeth will be whitish, but with a strong yellow-orange tone. I take a particular pleasure in filling in the outline of this head. All those hooked teeth were just lines before, but now that I've filled them in, I can feel how sharp they are. Same for the saliva. Giving it volume only enhances the wet movement of the tongue. I make Eddie kind of just peach colored. I want him desaturated and less vibrant than Venom because he's not the interesting part of this image. Uh, sorry, Eddie. Once I've added in the black skin and the white eye, the image starts to look officially like Venom. I'm having a blast already. For the first time in my life, I'm drawing Venom for Marvel, and he's so fun to draw. I focus on the teeth. Getting them right is really important to me, so I experiment a lot over the course of the image. I add shine, shadow, and coloring, and you'll see, I end up going back and forth a lot. I will mess with the shine on Venom's skin. Getting the materials right is important. I want his skin to look slimy, and that means having it reflect the background around the edges. So I was actually interviewed by Ryan Penagos over at Marvel for his podcast, This Week in Marvel. He asked me about my first real exposure to Marvel content, 
and I remember it was on my birthday when one of those friends gave me an issue of Spirits of Vengeance. Now I'd heard of Venom before and I'd seen Spider-Man's black suit, but the way illustrator Adam Kubert drew the symbiote, dynamic, savage, the epitome of leaping, laughing violence, left an indelible impression on me. When it comes to character art, nothing leaves an impression more than a strong personality. You can have a creature with 17 arms and a carrot for a face. If the audience wasn't left with an emotional connection to that creature, eventually they're just gonna kind of forget it. Adam Kubert understood the personality of Venom to a T. Back to the painting. Eddie Brock, as I said, doesn't matter that much, but he can't lag too far behind Venom, so I light him and I give him a five o'clock shadow using a little green. I add shadows to the tongue. I do this in multiple layers, with the most basic shadow layer being used in lopsided swaths across the tongue. The curving, uneven distribution of light and shadow gives the tongue a sense of dimension, making it look heavy and sloppy. From there, I just refine. I layer on shadows and light. I experiment with looks. I go deeper with values and do what I can to match colors and achieve visual harmony in the piece. Achieving harmony between Eddie and his symbiote is sort of important here for visual as well as thematic reasons. Symbiotic, involving interaction between two different organisms living in close physical association. When we talk about symbiotes, we're talking about relationships, healthy or otherwise. Symbiotes are a bit like us, passionate and troubled, confused, angry, and scared of being alone. Null ensured that his creations would be dependent on others. As powerful as they are, they literally cannot stand up for themselves. The point is they need us in order for them to become something more, just as we need each other. Anyone who tells you that they don't need other people has probably had a series of very bad relationships. We are all very different, but for us to successfully bond with others, we have to navigate egos, scars, and boundaries. We must communicate, learn the language of respect, and not let pain or passion distort who we are and who we want to become. So, who in your life builds you up? Who breaks you down? And how can we tell the difference? Just a few deep thoughts from your host. All right, as I finish out the image, let me just address the three individual close-ups in this piece. First, I've drawn a cross-section of Venom's eyes. As the illustrator for Marvel Anatomy, it is my job to visually explain that which has never been explained before. And in this case, I'm trying to showcase how symbiotes feed visual information to their hosts. In this image, the white ocular regions of the symbiote are composed of disc-shaped cells that absorb light and bend it like a lens progressively inward until the shrunken image makes direct contact with Eddie's eyes. So in essence, Symbiote eyes pull light from all around them, almost 270 degrees around them, and condense the information down to fit the human eye. Seen objectively, I imagine this information would appear squished and fish-eyed, but I'm also assuming that the psychic connection between symbiote and host would allow the host to easily conceive of the information just as the symbiote does, just like the human brain flips visual information 180 degrees around without us even thinking about it. This next detail, which is an up-close shot of the tongue, is meant to show off the microscopic tubes inside. Symbiotes can breathe through their skin, but especially in combat, it's likely that they'll need to harden that skin into something more armored. Human hosts, meanwhile, need to huff a great deal of oxygen all the time, so this is for them. I'm trying to demonstrate how symbiotes pull oxygen in for their hosts. I'm visualizing the tongue as a breathing tube. And those little gross nodules on the edges of their tongue, like the strange bubbly formations on a bulldog's gums, are actually openings for air. This final detail is meant to show off the microscopic serrations in the teeth. Micro serrations like this are actually very common in the natural world, so I thought it only fitting to showcase how symbiotes use these structures to inflict aggravated damage with each bite. And well, that's it. After a lot of polishing and noodling around, my image is finished and it's ready for the book. To review, here's a look at the thumbnail image that I started with. Here is a look at the finished inks. And here, in all its toothy glory, is the final image.
I have two things that I want to mention before I close today's video. The first is that the book Marvel Anatomy is out, finally. It's a 230-page compendium featuring over 60 heroes and villains packed front to back with information and artwork, all of it 100% approved by Marvel. Published by Insight Editions, this book is large and heavy, and the printing is immaculate. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local comic shop. For the hardcore collectors among you, you can get an autograph copy from my big cartel store. The link is down below. The second thing I have to say is this. I really, really love making these videos. I want to make so many more of them. But the truth is, I can't. This series has allowed me to share my journey with you, and hopefully provided entertainment and education to all. And while Marvel has graciously allowed me to create this series, they're not funding it. I am. And as an independent freelance artist, I just can't afford to continue. Not without your help. If you're enjoying this series and you want to see more, please consider supporting me on Patreon. As of today, I've opened up a new tier, a Marvel Anatomy tier, and it's pay what you want. Join up today and you'll get behind the scenes analysis of my artwork, watch further processed videos, see artwork that never made it into the book, and then even get a look at my own comic book, Quiet Level One, which is currently in development. What's more, every time I'm able to fill the Marvel Anatomy cup, I can pay my editor finally and we can make a whole new Marvel Anatomy video. So if you're enjoying the series and you believe that a quality art and creativity education should be available for all, don't delay. Click the link below, join up. And if we can't fund another Marvel Anatomy video, it's been a wonderful journey. Thank you so much for your time. Excelsior, and have a wonderful day.